uh, welcome back um, after the coffee. Um, we have uh, Mr. Mohammed uh, Shakil. Uh, he's one of my uh, good friend, uh, another fantastic um, head and neck, as well as uh, thyroid surgeon uh, from and Brampion. And uh, he has got a lot of experience in head and neck, and uh, he's going to um, talk about very practical applications of head and neck uh, in terms of lumps and the nodal distribution. I have seen his uh, talks before. It's, this is actually one of the amazing, uh, useful uh, talk. Um, uh, he has actually kindly recorded that. He's also available, uh, but I'm going to play the recording. Um, Jai, over the next half an hour or less, we will be talking about dealing with a neck lump, focusing on neck nodes and neck levels. This is Mohammed here. Very happy to be contacted if required. Some of the content in my presentation comes from online resources which are freely available and I hope there is no copyright issue. So at the end of the session, we should all have a clear understanding of neck lumps, how to deal uh, with a patient presenting with one, and we should feel comfortable describing cervical lymphadenopathy in relationship to neck levels. Some of this stuff may appear very basic, I apologize for that, but we have got uh, junior colleagues uh, attending the session, so it is to help them prepare for the exams. So you would all agree with me that this is a very important topic to deal with because majority of the conditions, surgical conditions appearing in the neck present as a lump. These are common in all age groups and reassuringly most are benign. Some of them may be malignant, and neck is a very complex region. We should have a structured approach when dealing with a neck lump, and that will come from having a sound understanding of normal anatomy, how the lymphatic system works in head and neck, common pathologies arising in the neck, how to assess a patient with a neck lump, and going through the differential diagnosis. In terms of normal anatomy, we have got structures in the neck which are really palpable, but for some patients, because they became aware of that, it may become abnormal, when in reality, this is a normal structure like thyroid notch. There are certain structures in the neck which become palpable when they are abnormal, like thyroid gland, which shouldn't be palpable in normal situation, but it can become palpable when enlarged. We have got a number of lymph nodes in the neck. We will learn about some of the terminology later on about neck triangles. If you look at the list of the normal structures, you would agree with me that we have got in the front part of the neck, hyoid bone, thyrohyoid membrane, thyroid cartilage, cricothyroid membrane, cricoid, trachea, thyroid gland, esophagus behind this structure, we have got nerves, vessels, arteries in the neck. We have got saliva lines, parotids, some mandibular suckling grow in this region. So this is important to understand these uh, normal structures, and only then we will be able to identify if there is any disease process in them. Commonly describe these structures in relationship to the triangles of the neck. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. And here triangle bounded by Mandible, midline, sternum asteroid, border. And within that, of course, we got some smaller triangles like carotid, some mandible, some mental, and muscular triangle. Posterior triangle is bounded by trapezius muscle, sternum asteroid muscle, and clavicle. 
there is another way of describing the neck nodes and once again i'm sure we're all familiar with those so mental so mandibular preauricular post auricular occipital and then we got anterior cervical posterior cervical and supraclavicular lymph nodes we will have a chance to go through these again later on to the talk very important to understand uh, what's the drainage uh, pathways for some of the uh, head and neck regions and then these neck nodes become knowledge become very important and uh, we will be dedicating a lot of time in the later half of the presentation about lymphatics lymph nodes and uh, how these are important when dealing with a uh, patient presenting with possible malignancy and uh, this will be the most important topic in my presentation, talking about neck levels primarily for our uh, junior colleagues. As we heard, there are a lot of important structures in the neck, so we need to be aware of uh, various pathologies which could arise from these uh, number of structures. Like any other part of the body, in the neck, lumps can be divided into various uh, subheadings as listed here. So we will briefly go through the uh, lists of these conditions and then we'll try to look at some of the photos and possible videos as well. Congenital neck lumps, more or less, we're very much familiar with these. Common ones being branchial cyst, thyroglossal duct cyst, sometimes laryngocele, Plunging granula in certain parts of the world. This is a relatively common condition. Then, of course, teratoma, derma cyst, lymphangioma, hemangioma, thymus related cyst, and sternomastite tumor of infancy. So, at this stage, <clears throat> I would like to show possible. Uh, video for you. If it works. So you could see this is a young boy. Look at the Something like that. That's good, thank you. Relax. Then focus on the last time, please. And something like that. Yeah. Thank you. So there was a thyroglossal duct cyst. And if we look at possible thyroid gland swelling, so let me try this one. Swallow again. So the left lower thigh line. Last. Okay. And while we are here, we can also look at a huge swelling. Um, I'm going to perform Pemberton sign testing on him in simple sense, raising your arms, basically looking for any superior mediastinal compression of the vasculature. So quite wide swelling doesn't move much. Pay attention well, to the yeah. veins. Um, would you mind raising your arms for me? Look at the veins. And his face uh, went red when he uh, uh, raised his, his arms. So we'll continue with uh, our uh, basically differentials of the possible neck lumps. So after the uh, congenital one, we got a big heading about uh, infective, which could be related to bacterial, viral, fungal infections. Lately, we have seen uh, cases of tuberculosis and we often get uh, referred to patients from a respiratory department about lymph node biopsy for suspected sulfidosis. HIV related uh, infective neck lumps uh, are commonly dealt in certain parts of the world as well. So third big heading is uh, inflammatory neck lumps. Some people may have more experience than me dealing with these conditions, but I have dealt with Kaimura's disease and Castleman uh, syndrome. Again, these are neck clumps related to lymph nodes and they are inflammatory in nature. 
New plastic is a big category, and we worry about metastatic squamous cell carcinoma in the hepatic region. It primarily could be related to lymph nodes, lymphoma, and uh, non cancerous slumps like lipoma, thyroid cyst, benign parotid masses, and of course, paraganglioma can be seen in neck lumps. And vascular neck lumps are not many, but carotid body tumor and aneurysm involving the uh, carotid artery and subclavian aneurysm are the ones to remember. So, based on such a long list of uh, differentials, how do you try to narrow it down? I think this is a very important slide to look at uh, if you could. So, if we get a neck lump and it's in the interior triangle and it is solid, it could be a lymph node, carotid body tumor, or thyroid related swelling. Three things mainly. If it's cystic, again, it could be branchial, dermoid cyst, plunging granula, or uh, tuberculous abscess. And thyroglossal duct cyst uh, is a relatively common uh, finding. And it does move up with swallowing uh, and tongue protrusion primarily. Posterior triangle, if we get a solid lump, most likely it's a lymph node, possible cervical rib. If it's a cystic swelling, maybe a cystic hygroma. I haven't seen any pharyngeal pouch presenting as a cystic swelling in the posterior triangle of the neck, but looks like it can happen in Norman brows. Pulsatile, we need to worry about subclavian aneurysm. So these slides will be available to you, so don't worry about uh, memorizing it. You can go through these later on. So once we get this um, background knowledge, how do we apply that into clinical practice? So this follows the same basic principle of uh, dealing with a patient, taking a good detailed history, and he will be focusing about uh, history of the neck lump, how did it start, duration, any changes since first noticed, any re related symptoms like pain or discharge from the neck lump. Then this is a box uh, focusing on important relevant symptoms to ask for. And if we look at each uh, symptom, uh, it, it has got some potential relationship to the eventual diagnosis, like recent uh, sore throat tonsillitis could be re related to uh, the active cervical infidinopathy. Uh, red flag symptom like dysphagia, dinophagia, refugiotalgia, hematemesis, hemoptysis. So these are like uh, worrying symptoms and looking for primarily for a lymphoma, let's say, night sweats, weight loss, malaise, these are uh, important red flag symptoms. Uh, if a relatively elderly gentleman presenting, let's say, with a carotid clump, you worry about any previous uh, skin cancer excise, so very important to ask uh, this history. Then uh, social history about smoking, drinking, uh, chewing, bitter nut, recent travel abroad, and uh, exposure to uh, animal dick spikes, etc. So this is another important slide to remember. Now, like with any other uh, patient, we will perform a detailed examination. In ENT, we'll uh, include laryngoscopy as part of our uh, examination. And uh, I think this should be done in majority of the neck lumps. We'll be focusing on the lump per se, looking at the number, the site, the size, the shape of the lump, the relationship of the overlying skin, any uh, relationship with the deeper lying structures, and of course, in certain structures, you would be uh, able to hear Brewery. Uh, completing examination with cranial nerve and scalp and skin of the head and neck, of course, you would do the systemic examination. So as I said, in ENT, laryngoscopy is part of our uh, examination. So just for refreshing our uh, knowledge about laryngoscopy, I'll just run this video. I won't spend too much time on it, but it just gives you the idea that it is so important to look for any hidden problems in the upper aero digestive tract. And here we're just trying to see what's going on in a patient who presented with a right neck level three swelling. So, so straight away you see a big tumor here. It's a hyperpharyngeal cancer distorting the laryngeal anatomy. You can't see the airways, you can't see the true cords. And um, this is the importance of carrying out laryngoscopy in patient presenting with neck lump in whom you worry most about cancer. So 
I'm sure we all do this procedure in our clinics all the time. So let's go back to our aim of dealing with the neck bone. <clears throat> so, so how do you, after going through the history examination, how do you investigate? Well, we of course do certain investigations and certain blood tests are helpful. Then we decide if the lump is big, we could, in at least in our practice, we do freehand FNSC. We are very fortunate to have such a helpful pathology department. And FNSC is essential in making the initial kind of a, um, point in terms of further investigation. If you've got a facility of ultrasound guided FNSC in neck lump clinic, this is brilliant. Chest X, they should have been done by the time the patient is referred to you. And then we decide about MRI, CT, and barium swallow. So as I keep saying, FNSC is the most important thing and get some idea whether the lump is a lymphoma or carcinoma. So this is what we do in our neck lump clinic. So this is my colleague demonstrating how we do FNSC. Patient tolerated really well. It's under no NSL, and uh, this is a common practice in our neck. Well, it's not a full neck arm clinic as we don't have radiology, but sort of a neck arm clinic. So once we done this uh, FNA, then uh, the pathologist they got this facility. Just for information, this is what happens with FNAC. You get the material sucked out into this range, and it goes on a slide. They spread it like this, and then this is the finished product, and it will be analyzed under the microscope. So you get some information whether this is a lymphoma, carcinoma, benign, periodic lump, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So so far, this is our uh, generic uh, overview of the uh, neck lump. Now, as I said, we'll be focusing on uh, neck nodes and uh, neck levels. So. Why? Because majority of the neck lumps are actually large lymph nodes and reassuringly uh, these are benign. In terms of how you describe them to your colleagues in a scientific uh, kind of uh, communication uh, level, it is important to have some terminology, some nomenclature, and we use neck levels for requesting FNC and radiology. So let's uh, moving on to uh, lymphatics and lymph nodes. So I'm sure um, we are all familiar, but for example, purpose, remember this world, while well, there's ring, very impressive. Again, sorry, it's taken from online resources, so I don't claim any ownership for this picture, but thanks to whoever uh, published it freely online. So looking at uh, the uh, internal uh, inner ring, we have got lingual tonsil, parent tonsil, tubal tonsil, adenoid tissue, called pharyngeal tonsil. Then we got outer rings of lymph nodes. We have already discussed some of these. Uh, another way of describing the same, maybe a little bit more easy to understand the concept of inner ring of Waldir's lymphatic tissue. And you will see they are related or connected to the lymph nodes on the outside of the neck. So again, some mandibular, some mental and jugular chain. And then it's important to know retropharyngeal nodes, very important in nasopharyngeal carcinoma and sometimes in thyroid uh, cancer as well. So. This is the important uh, uh, slide showing the concept about uh, lymphatic drainage, lymphoid tissue, the connections, and uh, of course that leads to uh, cervical lymphatic lymphatic. We describe them in terms of neck levels, and I would say this is very important to have a terminology and when you're requesting our investigation, it's important to say I want a fantasy of this neck level right neck level two lump. So everybody will understand which area we're talking about. So let's continue. There are uh, five levels we commonly deal with, and I will show these levels boundaries by looking at the next slide. And level six and seven uh, are in the anterior midline. So what is level one? Level one is basically some mental and some mandibular region. Level two corresponds briefly to the sternomastoid muscle. The upper one third is level two, middle one third is level three, lower one third is level four. Posterior triangle of the neck is level five. In the midline, you got level six. And that includes paratracheal uh, lymph nodes. And if it goes beyond supersternal notch area, lower down in the spirometry stinum, that's level uh, seven. <clears throat> so, 
what's the uh, importance? Well, if we have a, a large lymph node in a particular level, we will be able to look for the primary cancer in the relevant drainage area, like preauricular, you would look for uh, scalp, anterior half, and upper part of the face, skin malignancy related problems. Post-auricular and occipital lymph nodes, you will be looking for back of the scalp, post-auricular region for any cutaneous malignancy, sending metastatic deposit into the uh, post-auricular lymph nodes. Retropharynx, important in the pharyngeal carcinoma, and some other areas uh, here. Then, of course, level two, you would worry about uh, tonsil related malignancy, uh, if it's oral cavity, it's level one mostly. <laughs> level three, four related to hypothyroidism. And uh, level five, important to look for skin and scalp and post nasal space areas. Uh, level six, commonly involved in thyroid cancer. So, okay, another way of describing by this beautiful picture. And thank you to online resources. So, here we see. These are the drainage pathways. So once again, as I said, you will be able to see these slides later on, so not to worry. Just to understand the concept that lymph nodes in neck levels, we need to look at primary site of possible malignancy. So for example, purposes, uh, it's a very favorite question, how you kind of describe the size and site and uh, like uh, stage them. <clears throat> so again, uh, this is uh, older classification and uh, I will um, briefly mention um, direct uh, colleagues to refer to uh, TNM8 for uh, updated uh, classification in certain areas because exam question arises uh, what are the differences between TNM7 and 8. So just a generic concept, if there is a neck node on the same side where you suspect the primary, it is um, three centimeter less, it's N1. N2 is divided into A, B, C. It depends if there's a single ipsilateral node less than six centimeter is 2A. If you got multiple nodes, none is more than six centimeters, and to b And if it's bilateral or contralateral node, uh, none more than six centimeter is N to C. And N3 is, of course, a lymph node more than six centimeters. Just remember that, and then you can always uh, modify it depending on the area of the primary cancer. <clears throat> and of course, uh, we need to look at TNM8. Label modification, if there's an nasopharyngeal carcinoma, it goes into N1, 2, 3, but again, uh, just for uh, exam purposes, please read through the classification, and this has changed in TNM8, and I will show you that in a minute. So N1 is basically less than 6 centimeter. Uh, and of course, there's a very important aspect here in the older classification about supraclavicular fossa involvement or not. So we'll look at the TNM8 in, in a minute. And this is another descriptive uh, way of uh, describing the TNM. So N1, less than six centimeter, one-sided, but above supraclavicular region. And if you got bilateral, but above the important landmark here, less than six centimeter nodes, and 3 a big, big node, six centimeter, but not involving the superclavicular fossa, and N3B, if the lymph nodes uh, related to nasopharyngeal carcinoma are involving the superclavicular fossa. So just is something that we need to remember. I don't expect people to memorize it, but uh, I mean, important to remember for exam, but in every MDT, you would have uh, help available to look at the criteria for stating your uh, patient's cancer. Thyroid cancer has got a little bit different uh, way of describing the uh, metastatic lymph node. If there is one in the midline, it is N1A, midline mean level six. If it goes beyond that and there are lateral neck nodes involvement, it become N1B. Another way of describing thyroid cancer, no lymph nodes involvement, N0. You got paratracheal delphian node involved in thyroid cancer, N1A. If it goes into deeper or lateral neck, it becomes N1B. So again, from exam point of view, very important to remember. I just do an intersection for melanoma patients. I don't particularly deal with it, but uh, we need to have some uh, understanding about their end classification. And uh, I will let you read through the slide later on about it. 
So as I said, uh, things have changed over the last few years. So thanks to this uh, International Union uh, Against Cancer freely available resources, they have looked at TNM 7 and 8. And uh, I will let uh, colleagues to go through these slides later on and uh, understand the differences between older and newer classification. And uh, the important aspect is there is a uh, Im impact of uh, P16 positivity in oropharyngeal cancer and how that impact the overall staging. As you know, these cancers have excellent prognosis, so that has changed the oropharyngeal uh, P16 positive tumors um, nodal staging a bit. The other classification that has changed are nasopharyngeal and thyroid cancer and uh, unknown primary cancer of the neck. So very briefly, you can have a look, but I don't expect you to read through these slides. You will be able to read through later. So here in N classification, there has been a stress about extra um, nodal extension, um, clinically or pathologically. In that sense, um, there is a stress about uh, um, involvement of the skin or deeper structures in a pathological uh, large node. So just go through these ones for your life. As I said, now things have changed from three to scone, like a six centimeter or less, but in oropharyngeal P16 positive tumors. And again, this is important to remember. And in our MDT, we're using TNM8, but help is available to um, go back to this criteria and assign a number to our patients, uh, MDT Performa. In nasopharynx, uh, things have changed slightly because previously there was a lot of stress about uh, Superclavical force, and now we're talking about caudal border of cricoid cartilage. So it's important to again memorize this difference and be able to uh, talk about older and newer classification of nodal metastasis in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And unknown primary, again, this is a key depending on if it's HPV positive or B16 positive, you would stage them uh, according to their. Uh, re relative uh, um, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma and oropharyngeal carcinoma classification. So important, but as I said, MGDs will have uh, access to these documents, but important to memorize and remember these things. Thyroid, again, big difference between three now, A and B. And uh, prognosis wise, used to be 45 year of age cutoff, but now it's increased to 55. So important to focus on T3 for differentiated thyroid cancer uh, staging. So that brings us to the uh, last section of my presentation. And uh, I would say it's primarily aimed at uh, uh, colleagues who are preparing for exam. And But I would say it's important for all of us because it makes life easy in communicating among the team uh, dealing with neck problems. So let's look at this picture. So this is neck level uh, one swelling, primarily on the left side, some mental and some mandibular region here. Yeah? This is another left neck level uh, one swelling, some mental and some mandibular region, right? I agree. Looking at the same swelling from a different angle, this is some mandibular region swelling. So level one, so we suspect uh, cancer in this uh, kind of scenario where we will look for primary cancer. We will go into the mouth and look at this one, and this is a tongue cancer here. And then look at this one, level one lymph node, and we got tongue cancer here. Another patient presenting with floor of mouth cancer. So very important to look at the level where the lymph nodes are enlarged and look at the possible primary uh, cancer area. Another one, cancer. It's not infection, it's not something in loma, it is cancer. So moving on to level two swelling. Patient presenting with left neck level two corresponds to the upper one third of sternomastoid muscle, right? Another view of the left neck level two lymph node is elderly gentleman. It's 
not a branchial surgery as possible, but you would worry about metastatic cancer and level two, you would look at possible primary site into the mouth and oral pharynx. So this is another example. The patient is about to undergo panendoscopy, don't select me. Level two swelling here corresponds to the upper one third of the sternomastoid muscle. So when you look into the mouth, big tonsil on the left side, left tonsil malignancy. Right is normal. It was hard and palpation. You would excise it for primarily biopsy, and most likely this patient will need chemoradiotherapy. But important to understand level two, look into oropharynx tonsil malignancy. This is the right sided level two, corresponds to the upper one third of the sternum astroid muscle. You would look into the oropharynx. Big cancer eroding through the soft palate, quite big. This is not Quincy, not tonsillitis. Yes, ulcerated, but cancer, so please pay attention. Okay, another tonsil swelling, big thing. Right-sided tonsil is big. Turned out to be lymphoma for this patient, but again, he had uh, level two swelling. Okay, so moving on to uh, level three. Here, we just see a big bulge. It was actually occupying level two and level three together. This patient is about to go pan, undergo panadoscopy and uh, left tonsillectomy. So where would you look for primary? Tonsil, big tonsil. Hard and level two and three, look into all the for tonsillar malignancy. Okay, so this patient has got level three, middle one third of the sternomastoid muscle. This is the swelling. It was moving up with swallowing, stuck to the thyroid. Turned out to be thyroid lymphoma, actually. Level three, right side. Oh, look at the middle one third of stenomastry. This patient had um, hyperpharyngeal carcinoma. Remember, the, uh, it will be the same as we seen the flexible laryngoscopy earlier on, primary tumor. So another one involves level two and level three. The low, lowest uh, one third of sternum is free. So this is the cancer level two, level three swelling. And you will look far into the uh, pharyngeal, like a hyperpharynx or pharynx area. So this is right sided neck level four. Big bulge, sternum lower one third, and this is the swelling. Another way of looking at it. You look at the hyperpharynx, but you would look, also look for thyroid related malignancy. Okay, so now we're moving on to level five. As I said, level five, lump in the posterior triangle, sternomastoid, occipital bone, trapezius, clavicle. It doesn't project well, but I have taken a photo to show you. This is the big lump in the posterior triangle of the neck. And this patient had a melanoma excised previously from the uh, right side, similar. So look for the skin problem that drains into the posterior triangle of the neck. So big one, right posterior triangle, whole neck is replaced by this big lump. Yeah, and this patient needs uh, investigation and laryngoscopy, FNSC, uh, CT scan, neck and chest. Okay, so level six, as we said, this is the anterior midline of the neck. This is the lump. It could be anything, but in this patient, I think it was low lying thyroglossal cyst. Could be lymph node if it's related to thyroid cancer. Need to be aware of that. So just trying to raise the kind of more awareness about neck level. Thyroid is the nodule level six here. Okay, so moving on to some other uh, neck levels. And if we look at this one, level two, possible three, and level five. And a few years after previously injected me, this patient presented with this lump, had an investigations, including history examination, laryngoscopy, FNSE, core biopsy, sarcoma. You just need to be aware of that as well. So the mass is covering the level three, four, and five, and cancer eroding through hyperpharyngeal cancer on the right side. 
So very important to be aware of this possibility. It is not a simple thing, it is cancer. The patient needs to be referred to urgent uh, cancer clinic, Helena Cancer Clinic. Okay, big swelling occupying the periotic tail, uh, level two, maybe one, three, and yeah, just sitting in the water. So a lot of areas it's uh, kind of uh, sitting in. So need to be aware of possible problems in the primary area. Another patient, bilateral lymph nodes here, there. So a lot of triangles and levels involved. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma presenting with a bilateral cervical lymph must have post-nasal space examination. Of course, FNAC as well. Okay, so coming to the end of the presentation, quite big neck swelling involving more or less all level rock solid when I felt it. That's a high grade Hartman's lymphoma. So this brings us to the last slide to acknowledge some of the resources I have used. And uh, instead, I'm grateful to these resources. I just shared this. Uh, pictures that have been taken from my own patients and they're consented, so okay for educational use. So thank you. I'm happy to uh, participate in any uh, question you might have. For listening. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, Shakti, that's so many um, photographs, high quality, very informative um, and it's a pictorial uh, representation um, you're spot on uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk um, we'll look for thank any you, That's very good. I thought it's very important although it's very basic but uh, this is the thing when I was a registrar I struggled to kind of uh, prepare myself properly for exam so purely talking about this thing for my registrar colleagues basically that's absolutely good. Um, we'll check any uh, Q&A there. That's good. No questions, but uh, I'll ask uh, some questions. Um, I find it sometimes the level two is actually confusing with a parotid lump. Uh, what's your experience? Uh, you are absolutely right, Jay. Parotid tail, if especially if it's a low lying, and uh, I think Panas will agree that uh, he has lately suggested that if you got a low lying parotid tail or level two, you basically take some of the lymph nodes with that lump out as well, right, Panas? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you, you, the ultrasound F guided FNA should give you an idea whether it's parotid tissue or a lymphoid tissue from a mm -hmm. gland. But um, if you have a parotid gland that is going very low and you think it's cancer, then uh, <clears throat> at the time of surgery, you should sample level two because it's right there during the parotidectomy incision. Um, the advantage of that is, if you, if you, is that if you go to your MDT and there's a low-grade cancer in the parotid, you can see that your lymph node uh, sampling uh, was benign and the patient doesn't need any further treatment and you're done. Uh, but uh, yeah, it can be clinically, it can be very difficult to determine. And that's why ultrasounds are extremely important. One stop ultrasound uh, is, is the way future for whole units. Good. Thank you. There's a question. Um, at which point uh, do we do co biopsy in the, in the neck lump as part of the investigation? I think over practice has been to do. Uh, Ultrasound. I mean, normally what we do in Aberdeen, we do a freehand FNAC at the time you're seeing a patient. If that gives you a clear answer, lymphoma or carcinoma, you stage them accordingly. If that comes non-diagnostic, you would have requested ultrasound-guided FNAC. In our radiology department, they could also do core biopsy, but only if the two FNAs have been non-diagnostic or not helpful. And to be honest, we at that stage will be doing the core biopsy over cells in our a rapid access clinic in the ward. Uh, that's absolutely a brilliant answer, but I would add a few more things. For example, uh, some centers um, diagnose lymphoma with a co-biopsy. So if your center is happy, uh, if you suspect clinically that's more lymphoma, you would consider a co-biopsy straight away, but there is no harm in doing freehand if any to start as a starting point. That's a gold standard because any head and neck tumors, 80% of the diagnosis uh, can be uh, achieved by a good uh, FNAC. 
uh, sometimes uh, thyroid uh, tumors, um, some centers prefer co-biopsy, probably Homer will point out at some point as well in his talk. Uh, okay, we'll move on to the other uh, question. There's a lot of questions. Um, Let for, me open the question session, yeah, myself here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remove both tonsils? So up until now and with the recent um, PET uh, study, uh, I think our practice had been to do ipsilateral tonsillectomy, but uh, growing uh, consensus is to a bilateral tonsillectomy because it makes not only the diagnosis 100% there, you're not missing a smaller uh, second cancer in the contralateral tonsil, but also make prognosis, I mean, follow up a bit easier. So currently we are uh, swaying towards bilateral tonsillectomy. That's right. Um, uh, I would slightly disagree with that. If there is a, a clear a tumor there is logically and radiologically proven um, just a tonsil biopsy uh, is actually more than enough or maybe an elateral tonsillectomy. For unknown primaries, for example, um, MRI is negative or CT is negative, even PET is negative, then a guidelines recommends a bilateral tonsillectomy and tongue-based mucosectomy for unknown primaries. Um, but it, it, the pragmatic approach varies from centers to center. I respect that. The next question, uh, how will you manage secondary node uh, with the overlying skin eroded? Yes, so I think it's a very important question. And Mr. Majumdar was saying that you should be working as a team. So at this stage, I think, uh, depending on the primary uh, type of the cancer, uh, I think if surgery is the chosen kind of modality, then you will be working in collaboration with your plastic surgery colleague because I, and panels work with them. So we will excise the skin. We will try to do a primary uh, um, a local advancement flap reconstruction. But uh, if it's a secondary salvage surgery, then of course they, they need a more kind of a healthy um, particled flap reconstruction. So to answer your question, I think you have to deal with the skin surgically and better to do it in conjunction with plastic surgery. Agree. And uh, what is your opinion about a recurrent intraparotid lymph node in six years old child excluded by histo and immuno, no lymphoma, but still recur and about two to three centimeter in biggest diameter? Uh, what is the needed plan? Complex question. Oh, yeah, I think uh, I, I would say I'm not the best person to answer, but I, I, I fully appreciate this is such a difficult situation because whatever you say to family, they are not going to settle down. So I would put it to anybody else to handle this question. Is Ian yeah. or Thomas? I would excise the, I would, I would excise it because, you know, you need to exclude the mucopidermoid carcinoma in the child. So uh, it needs to come out. And sometimes the FNA, I mean, was it an FNA record done before? What was it done? Quite often, five-year-old kids won't let you go near an FNA. You need to put them under anesthetic. So might as well excise it. So uh, very careful superficial protodectomy or partial protodectomy even. But I would excise it to exclude nuclear carcinoma. I think Mr. Hilmi is here. So in, in Glasgow, I'm sure we, when I was there, there were a lot of uh, lymphadenopathy in children. So Mr. Hilmi, what would you suggest here? Yeah, I mean, it depends what you think the underlying etiology in this situation is. As you know, I don't do pediatrics, but for the pediatric cases, you've got to be concerned this could be an atypical TB as well as uh, anything malignant. So I, I think I would want more information. I, I would um, certainly consider a general anesthetic core biopsy in this sort of case. And we have done those in kids, both for thyroid and for other uh, lesions. Um, I wouldn't jump in straight to surgery. Yep, uh, I totally agree. Anything more than two centimeter, according to Hayden Kuba's uh, article, um, needs to be kind of, um, some kind of intervention is needed. You can't just discharge the child. That's the important point. That's great. Thank you very much. And um, uh, we have um, Mr. Omar Hilmi is one of my uh, friend and, and friend in need sometimes comes and helps me uh, in, in complex surgeries, uh, including a few days back, we were operating together for a 10 year old child with the thyrotoxicosis and neutropenia. Um, and he's very experienced a thyroid and parathyroid surgeon. 
Uh, he holds a high position in BATS as well as he organized many meetings and he's also a chair for Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh Speciality Board. I'm um, happy to uh, introduce him and also he's going to talk about thyroid cancer. Uh, it's a big topic, but he will uh, entertain you for the next uh, 35 minutes and you can take some questions at the end as well. Thank you. Um, or, yeah. You can unmute and share your screen, please. Perfect. We can see your screen. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely fine. Fantastic. Okay. Now, I'm just wondering which screen of mine you can see at the moment because hopefully that's the one. So, yeah. Thyroid cancer. Now, I'm going to limit what I talk about today because, as Jay has said, thyroid cancer is a very big topic. I'm not going to go into the significant features of the diagnosis. Um, basically, what I'm going to talk about are the principles of thyroid cancer management. And then I'm going to split it up into three sections. We've got early thyroid cancer, we've got management of the neck in thyroid cancer, and then management of advanced thyroid cancer. And after each of these sections, I'm going to ask you guys if you've got any questions, because trust me, uh, you don't want to be waiting till the end of the talk to ask them. Now, this is a bit of a difficult situation because I really like the bit of interaction and the bit of chat that goes through with face-to-face uh, -face meetings. So doing it completely online, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone. So please bear with me. So what do we know about thyroid cancer? Well, it can be classified as a rare cancer because it's only responsible for 0.6% of cancer deaths. But in the UK, it overall has an incidence of roughly anything between 1,600 to 2,000 cases per year with a prevalence of around three per 100,000. So this is a cancer that you will certainly see in your clinical practice. Um, and although the cancer deaths are rare, the actual disease itself is not that uncommon. And it's been increasing. Now, this is the incidence of thyroid cancer in Scotland from 1986 to 2008. And you may ask yourselves, well, why are we interested in those dates? Well, some of you may remember that there was a, a little bit of a fire at a, at a power station uh, in Russia at the time, um, just before 1986. And we were predicted that thyroid cancer was going to increase because, of course, radiation, iodine 121 being released, people being given iodine tablets as anti-radiation tablets to try and prevent thyroid cancer. We were anticipating a rise in these cancer deaths. And, and sure enough, we've seen it across the board. But does this represent a true rise in cancer, or is it simply that we're getting better at detecting it? And this is something we don't know. Now, if you take a look across the world, this is, this is the European figures. And as you see, the UK is well down at the bottom of the league on this one, um, as with so many other things. But we're happy about that. We don't want to have a high rate of thyroid cancer. But the interesting thing is, you see all those Eastern European countries that we're going to have these really high rates. They're not at the top. Southern Europe, what's going on in Malta and Cyprus and France? These are areas that shouldn't have been affected by Chernobyl. So there's obviously something taking place there. Now, when we talk about Chernobyl, we also think this is still affecting us. There are parts of Scotland where you still can't farm the sheep because of the risk of radiation exposure. So this was a very real risk, but we're not necessarily seeing it in terms of thyroid cancer in the UK. Now, you all know this. There are roughly speaking four types of thyroid cancer and lymphoma, as was mentioned earlier on. Now, the ones that we're most interested in, the papillary and the follicular thyroid cancers, often known as differentiated thyroid cancers, make up 90% of the workload. Medullary thyroid cancer, 5%, and anaplastic or undifferentiated the rest. Now, medullary thyroid cancer, a lot of said about this. And the reason is, is, is that you've got a blood test to detect it, and physicians love a blood test. Plus, there's a genetic predisposition, and physicians love genetics. And there's a cancer syndrome, the MEN2, MEN2A and MEN2B, where you've got an association with genetics. So you can get all sorts of questions in your exams on this, and they're fair game. Now, the thing to bear in mind, medullary thyroid cancer, yes, there's a genetic predisposition to it, but not all patients with a genetic medullary thyroid cancer have MEN2. There is just genetic incidence for it, but it can also be sporadic. 
derived from the parafollicular or C cells, these are concentrated in the superior pole of the thyroid. So if you're doing thyroid surgery for a medullary thyroid cancer, you need to be careful about that area up near Barry's ligament and beyond. They are not TSH dependent and they're not iodine avid. So as we'll discuss later on, you can't use some of the adjuncts that we have for differentiated thyroid cancer. Anaplastic thyroid cancer, this is just a horrible disease. I mean, it's very aggressive. Most patients present with incurable disease, often with airway obstruction or swallowing problems at the time of diagnosis, and most are dead within six months. At one time, they used to say the only operation you should do for anaplastic thyroid cancer is a biopsy or a tracheostomy. Um, certainly, I agree that a biopsy may be indicated. I'm not convinced about a tracheostomy because actually, are we changing things for the patient or are we just making their life hell in the last few weeks by keeping them trapped in hospital with a tracheostomy that can't be managed? So that was the feeling. Things may be changing now, though, and we'll discuss that later on. The ones I'm really interested in to discuss today are the differentiated thyroid cancers, the papillary and the follicular. And these have got some specific features that make our life easier. And the first thing is they're TSH dependent. So you can affect potential metastatic growth of these by putting them on suppressive doses of thyroxine because they do retain the host characteristics of normal thyroid cells. Because of that, they also take up iodine, which means you can use radioactive iodine for either scanning to look for early signs of disease or ablation to destroy any potential metastasis at higher doses. And they also produce thyroglobulin in common with the thyroid. Now, if you've taken the thyroid out, you shouldn't be producing much or any thyroglobulin. So therefore, if you see the thyroglobulin level increasing, you can use that to assess whether there's any metastatic disease, and it gives you early warning to maybe do further scanning, uptake scans, see what else is going on. But you can only do that if the thyroid's been removed. Now, there is one caveat to that, and that is, is that if the patient is producing antibodies to thyroglobulin, you can't use thyroglobulin to assess that, in which case you need to do the antibody titers to see if they're increasing or decreasing, and that will tell you the disease behavior, okay? How do we stage thyroid cancer? Well, everyone knows TNM. This is it for papillary and follicular. Um, I've taken out the things for the others. You've also got the final staging. And the important thing to take from this slide is, is that age is important. Because actually, if you're young, you can't have any more than stage two disease, even with very advanced disease because you're going to do well. You've got a survival rate of 85 to 95%, even with distant metastasis, as long as you're less than 55. It's one of those figures that's banded around is that young women with a diagnosis of thyroid cancer are supposed to have a life expectancy that's greater than young women without, simply because, well, we don't know. Why should they live longer if they've got a thyroid cancer than not? And there's various theories, all of which, of course, are rubbish because they're just theories. Doctors may be simply the presence of having come near a doctor has somehow enabled them to live longer. Maybe lifestyle changes by the patients. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they look after themselves a bit better. Maybe doctors pay a bit more attention to them when they come up with non-specific symptoms simply because they've had a cancer and so will investigate earlier. The simple answer is we don't know. But for whatever reason, these patients are going to do very well. And even in the over 55s, you can see that really with quite advanced disease, T4A, nodal disease in the neck, you've got quite a high survival rate. And this is mimicked in the other staging systems. You've got MACIS and you've got AIMS. You don't need to know the accurate details of this, simply that they exist. And you can go online and there's various calculators which will tell you, given your patient's clinical findings, what their life expectancy is. So it's got a really good prognosis. It's also really good for surgeons because it is a surgical disease and surgery is the most effective least morbid and cheapest treatment for most cancers. I'll give you lymphoma, you don't want to do it. But for almost anything else, if you can operate, you've got the potential to cure. And we like that, that's what we do this job for. Now, when we're talking of thyroid cancer surgery, we've got to bear in mind what are our aims of surgery. Now we want this, the top one, a surgical cure the removal of all cancer-bearing tissue, not needing any other treatment, the patient can be reassured you are cured of your disease. The problem is, 
we're never quite certain in if it's anything more than the earliest of disease processes. And so therefore, most of our cancer operations, I'm talking about all cancers here, not thyroid cancer, is the removal of all macroscopic disease with a view to cure. But you know what? We'll also use something else, something to make sure there's no metastasis to reduce the chance of local recurrence. And then finally, the one that we don't discuss much really is the, the surgical palliation. And in this situation, we don't hope to cure the patient. We simply want to ensure that they maintain as good a quality of life for as long as possible while living with their disease. Okay. So when you go into any form of cancer operation, it's especially important in thyroid cancer, think about which of these you're going to do. Because you can cause an awful lot of morbidity and not necessarily significantly improve things for the patient if you choose the wrong option. Now, most head and neck cancers that we have, we've, our adjuvant treatments are going to be external beam radiotherapy and or chemotherapy. Now, these carry significant morbidities. You know, the patient's got to come in six weeks getting their radiotherapy. Their throat is going to get increasingly sore. The pain's going to last for several months afterwards. They may have difficulty in swallowing. They may have breathing difficulties. They'll certainly get the reaction. And even moving forward, there are long-term complications of it. We don't like giving our patients these treatments. We want to try and get that surgical cure so we don't need to use the adjunctive treatments. And so head and neck cancer surgery is very much aimed at that. We accept that a lot of them are going to get this, but we do try our best to get that cure. But thyroid cancer is different. Our adjuvant treatment is radioactive iodine. Now, for radioactive iodine, you come into hospital for a couple of days. You stay in a lead-lined room, and technically anything that comes out of your body becomes radioactive waste, as long as it doesn't enter a toilet. So you need to throw everything away. Everything needs to get sent away. As long as it's in the toilet, that's OK. Apparently, it's diluted. But you've got to keep away from everybody else. Now, two days of isolation, yet yeah, we're kind of getting used to that at the present time. But people can cope with that. It's not like the six weeks of external beam radiotherapy. And because it has very little morbidity, actually, why would we hold back on it? The metastases that we have, as we said, are TSH dependent. So therefore, you can suppress them with suppressive doses of thyroxine. And we've got that tumor marker so that once we've treated the patient, if there is sign of the tumor marker increasing, we can then go in early to intervene before any significant damage has occurred. So we've got an awful lot of things on our side. But all of these things do rely on there being very little functioning thyroid tissue present. So we do still need to do surgery. But the question is, how much surgery do we need in any given situation? And this is where we start talking about how advanced the disease is. Now, the basic operation, the minimum operation you should realistically do for anything related to the thyroid is a hemithyroidectomy. And this is the complete removal of one lobe of the thyroid, including the isthmus. OK, complication of that, well, they may require hormone replacement, although most won't, and vocal cord palsy. These patients generally do really well. Yes, you can get bleeding. Yes, you can get excessive scarring. But the real complications that we worry about would be a cord palsy. The other operation, of course, is a total thyroidectomy. Now, in this case, everything's removed. Therefore, you've got to give thyroid hormone replacement. You may get a cord palsy, and that may be bilateral, may need a tracheostomy. Hyperparathyroidism, we often underplay this, but hypercalcemia is a significant complication of thyroid surgery and occurs quite in quite high figures. If you take a look at the Bates uh, audit, about 20% of patients will get short-term problems with hypercalcemia, and about 5 to 8% will actually need long-term medication for this. And actually, that's far more of a big deal than needing thyroid hormone replacement, because if you're hypercalcemic, if you miss your medication, even for a couple of days, you will start getting problems. Your fingers will start to tingle, your legs, you'll get periorbital issues, and you could get severely unwell fairly rapidly. So do not underestimate hypoparathyroidism. Now, historically in the management of thyroid cancer, every patient got a total thyroidectomy. They all got radioactive iodine ablation. They all got TSH suppression, and they all got their thyroid globulin estimation done annually. And if you say that, in an exam result, you probably will pass it. It's not a good answer, but it's an answer that will get you the marks to come through. But even these treatments are not without their issues. 
radioactive iodine ablation, although it is safe, very easily given, you do get some dryness of your mouth, and patients don't like the idea of radiation. TSH suppression, yeah, not a problem in the short term, but in the longer term, as patients get older, it can put more suppress on the uh, pressure on their heart, they can get issues with AF. More importantly, they're going to get issues with osteoporosis and osteopenia. So that can cause issues as they get older with their hips and other joints. And thyroglobulin, well, not much complication related to that, but it's still a cost that patients incur. And in the States, one of the commonest causes of medical related bankruptcy is from the treatment of thyroid cancer. So costs do have an implication. So do we really need to go that far in every case? Can we rein back from doing absolutely everything? And this, of course, is part of the problem. This is that these days, this is an ultrasound. This is a very small thyroid cancer. It's about two or three millimeters in size, but it is a thyroid cancer. And if you're diagnosing that, if you're then going to go on and do all that to the patient, well, are you doing the patient a service or are you over-treating them? So let's go back to that surgical cure. Can we cure patients with thyroid cancer by surgery alone without using these adjuvant treatments? And how much surgery do we need? Well, by definition, surgery for our early thyroid cancer, there can't be any local or distant metastasis. All the cancer has got to be removed and there can't be any local invasion. You don't want any of the more aggressive histologies. This is for papillary thyroid cancer, but not all papillary thyroid cancers are equal. There are some which have worse prognosis, such as your tall cell, your columnar cell, things like this. And if you've got one of the poorer prognosis ones, we do generally tend to treat them a bit more aggressively. Size does matter. Um, at one time, we used to say size up to a centimeter. We're now pushing that and saying maybe size up to two to four centimeters in one lobe of the thyroid. You can technically do a, a hemithyroidectomy and be reassured that you've probably cured that patient. Tumor markers, we're not sure what goes on with those yet. There was a, a fad certainly in the west of Scotland for a while that if patients were BRAF positive, then we should be more aggressive in our management. But actually, we're now identifying that patients with BRAF positivity probably the tumor doesn't behave any more aggressively. It's just that the more aggressive tumors present with BRAF earlier. So for early disease, we now generally recommend doing a hemithyroidectomy with the caveat that if any of those features are present when we do the final histological analysis, we may need to go back in and do completion surgery. In the same way, as we said that for our follicular lesions, which are Thy3F, which you'll already know about. The problem is, is, is that as surgeons, we do know that we understage disease based on our preoperative findings. And so there is a tendency for us to just sort of, well, I'm a little bit worried about this. I think it's probably going to be okay we always tend to err on the side of caution. So there is, or we've always got to consider and rein ourselves back and think, actually, are we treating the patient or are we treating ourselves? And make sure that we don't try and push to do a total thyroidectomy, where actually a hemithyroidectomy is probably the appropriate management. But this then brings up another question. If this tiny papillary thyroid cancer is only a few millimeters in size. We know from cadaveric studies that anything from 12 to 30% of people who've died from unrelated causes, if you look at their thyroid, will have small thyroid cancers like this. So do they need any treatment at all? And if you're in Kobe, this is Kuma Hospital in Japan, they actually go for an active surveillance on these patients. Now, the cutoff point about when you should consider active surveillance depends. In Kobe, they reckon about up to one and a half centimeters in size. You can simply keep an eye on these patients with serial ultrasound scans, assuming that it is a solitary nodule, that the gland is otherwise normal, that it's not near any other structures. Assuming that you've got a medical team that's willing to do this and facilities to follow up the patient with ultrasound. And generally speaking, 
that the patient is motivated to do that. Now, they've said older patients because older patients are likely to be more stable. If you've got someone who's younger and wanting to go all the way around the world, they may not be able to attend for regular follow-ups and regular scans for this sort of regime. But if you've got someone who's stable, like myself in their 50s, unlikely to move anywhere in a hurry, there's no reason why you can't simply keep an eye on these patients. And what they found is that a significant number of these patients with biopsy proven papillary thyroid cancer, the cancers actually get smaller over time. They don't get bigger. And the vast majority of them can continue on this regime. Now, of course, if the tumor starts to increase in size, you're going to need to convert onto surgery. If you notice any metastatic disease during the period of follow up, you're going to need to go for surgery. And if there's signs of local invasion, so if they developed a cord palsy, that would push you towards surgery. Similarly, if the patient doesn't want it, you're going to go for that. But over 90% of these patients are successfully managed simply by keeping an eye on these and therefore avoiding all the morbidity associated with even a hemithyroidectomy. To facilitate this, we also have a better assessment system. In the UK, we use the U system for assessing our thyroid nodules. This is the ACR TIRADS, um, and this is a system for ultrasound classification of nodules that they're using in the States, and they use similar things in Europe. Originally developed by the Koreans as the Korean TIRADS, what it does is it actually gives a physical score to any of the features on ultrasound. So, for instance, taller than wide gets a score of three as opposed to zero in the shape of it. Echogenicity, composition, margin, all these things come together to give an overall point score. And depending on those points, they then decide, does this patient need a biopsy? Does this patient need a follow-up? So a TR5 is one where you're, you're pretty sure this is a cancer, but if it's less than half a centimeter in size, you don't even need to follow that patient up. You can leave it alone. Similarly, TR3, analogous to our U3s, you would only sample it if it's more than two and a half centimeters. Otherwise, you do a simple follow-up. If in any given 12-month period it increases by more than three millimeters, well, that's a change and you would then sample that. Similarly, if there's any other features, you would then sample it. But what this enables us to do is a period of active surveillance before we've even proven that these patients have got a cancer. Now, this isn't used routinely in the UK at present, but I'm sure it will come over here. And it's really helped rationalize things in the States. Anyone got any questions about that? I think there is one question. Um, Go on. Uh, what is the difference between the suppressive and replacement dose of thyroxine? How are these? Okay, a replacement dose of thyroxine, you're aiming to get a TSH level of um, within the normal range. So that's between sort of, um, I mean, generally speaking, we aim for between one and two, um, but anything below five is reasonable for that. A suppressive dose of thyroxine, you're aiming for below one, and in some cases make TSH um, undetectable. And uh, for how long do you follow up uh, microcarcinomas? Okay, under the TIRAD system, you follow them up for five years. Um, and if there's no change at that period, you, they can be discharged. It depends. The, the system actually is fairly categorical about what you can and can't do. But certainly, a, um, uh, if it's less than 0.5 centimeters, then you don't need to follow it up at all. Um, if it's larger than that, you go for five years. And if at the end of five years, there's no change, you can discharge that patient with advice. What, what is the frequency of ultrasound examination in those patients under active surveillance? Is anyone in the UK currently doing this? Uh, we're doing this in Glasgow um, on uh, select patients, yes. And I think there are other centres. I think they're doing it in London as well. Uh, next question, the significance of anti globulin levels. Please, if you could um, repeat. Sorry, I didn't hear that. The significance of anti globulin levels. Okay, the significance of, um, I, I take it you're meaning uh, thyroglobulin antibodies. Um, the significance of antibodies is you can't use thyroglobulin as your marker because 
it will all get sopped up. Um, in which case, you use the antibody level as your marker. Um, the absolute value is not important. It's the trend that is important. So if the antibody level is going down, that suggests there's no disease present. If the antibody level is increasing, that suggests there's potentially increasing disease presence, and you would want to investigate that. Brilliant. Uh, next question. Beautiful presentation for post-operative care of differentiated thyroid cancer. Do you do both radioactive iodine and the TSM suppression, or what determine your choice? Uh, it depends on the uh, extent of disease. Um, a lot of patients now, we do not give radioactive iodine to at all, and we simply go for normal levels of um, thyroid replacement. I generally aim for a thyroid replacement regime of less than two, because if it's more than that, then sometimes patients are mildly hypothyroid. Um, routinely, um, we discuss all these cases in MDT, and it is an MDT discussion overall. But unless there's uh, um, worrying features, most of these patients, uh, we simply keep an eye on them. The next question, how do you uh, pick up thyroid cancer? All thyroid lumps should be scanned. OK. Um, pick up thyroid cancer, that, that's, that's a neck lump assessment question. Most thyroid cancers will present with a lump in the neck. Um, you do not need to scan diffuse thyroid swelling unless there's a very short history. Diffuse thyroid swelling suggests either thyroiditis or a goiter. If you've got a discrete thyroid mass, that is when you would get your ultrasound scan and your biopsy. Um, you can't rely on freehand FNAC for thyroids um, simply because size doesn't necessarily matter and frequently, um, certainly in a multinodular goiter, you need to sample the most worrying appearing nodule on ultrasound, which may not necessarily be the largest. The other presentation you sometimes get is um, certainly with follicular thyroid cancer, they can present with bony metastasis um, and so pathological fractures and they do a scan and notice, oh, there's something going on in the thyroid and it can spread there. But we'll go into that um, in, a, in, in a short time. I've not finished my presentation yet. Brilliant. I think we'll wait for, yeah, carry on, please. Okay, so, so that's early stage disease, but do we need to worry about the neck and thyroid cancer? Well, there are two schools of thought in days gone by. You probably don't recognize this individual here because he, he wasn't real. This was an actor uh, who played the part of Sir Lancelot Spratt, and he was a general surgeon. And the general surgeons used to do the majority of thyroid surgery um, up until relatively recently. Now we've rationalized it into specialist endocrine surgeons and ENT thyroid specialists. But at that time, anyone would have a go at it. And in days gone by, before you had all the scanning that we've got these days, the ultrasounds, the CTs, and that sort of thing, um, basically they'd have a feel of the neck. And if there were any obvious lymph nodes, the general surgeon would just take those lumps out. Now, of course, as ENT surgeons, we knew better. You don't treat necks like that. You do a radical neck dissection. You'd clear all the nodes from level one to six. You'd take sternomastoid muscle out. You'd take the internal jugular vein out and the accessory nerve. That was how you cured cancer. But of course, the simple answer is we were both wrong. The general surgeons were basically sampling it and the ENT surgeons were being way too aggressive. We're far more selective in what we do now. Hence the term of selective neck dissection. Now, we do not go and do radical neck dissections. We don't even do modified radical neck dissections in the majority of cases. These days, we'll do a selective neck dissection. If nodes in a given basin are involved, we will take that nodal basin away. But there's no reason to take away structures that thyroid cancer doesn't metastasize to. It doesn't generally metastasize to the sternomastoid muscle. It doesn't metastasize to nerves. And yes, follicular thyroid cancer can travel into the internal jugular vein. And if there is direct invasion, you can take it, but there's no need to routinely do it. Now for the purposes of thyroid cancer, you need to lower the levels of the neck. I'm not gonna go through that because that's already been discussed. I'm Mohammed. We've got the central compartment and the lateral compartment. Bear in mind that there are over 100 lymph nodes in the neck, more than 50 each side. So taking a few out is neither treating a cancer or satisfactorily sampling it. OK, so you, if you're going to do anything, do it as a level, but do it comprehensive for that level. Now, when we assess the necks, we do our ultrasound and we may or may not get a biopsy. Should you do a CT scan? Well, 
Yes, if you've got an extensive disease in the thyroid and you're concerned about metastatic disease in the neck, all in level six, extending down into the mediastinum, of course, get a CT scan. Now, some people say you shouldn't give contrast. Um, it doesn't matter as long as it's before the surgery. The rationale behind not giving a contrast for a CT for a patient with thyroid cancer is, is that you could potentially stun any metastatic thyroid cells, and so they wouldn't take up radioactive iodine postoperatively. But if this is preoperatively, they've already got very high circulatings of thyroid hormone replacement that are going to have to come down anyway. By the time they get radioactive iodine, they're going to have had a period of washout. So the contrast iodine that you've given is not going to make any difference, but you will get much better images than with a non-contrast scan. So these days, you do not need to worry about giving contrast for thyroid cancer preoperatively. We will do a selective neck dissection directed by the disease rather than just let's take everything out. Okay, now the central compartments from the hyoid bone all the way down to the innominate vein, including the thyroid. The lateral compartment, you don't generally go above the accessory nerve unless there is presence of disease up at level 2B. So below the nerve, these are the areas that you are. So lateral compartment, central compartment. And roughly speaking, this covers most thyroid neck surgery. The problems arise when there aren't any nodes present in the neck, because we need to bear in mind that different versions of differentiated thyroid cancer behave differently. Now, Follicular thyroid cancer, this is the one we diagnose on the basis of our thigh 3 fs from our biopsies, um, is normally diagnosed after a hemithyroidectomy. You'd think I'd be able to spell thyroid correctly, wouldn't you? But clearly I can't. It metastasizes late and it spreads by the bloodstream. It doesn't go by the lymphatics. So these are the ones that can present with your pathological fractures but there may be nothing in the neck. So there's absolutely no rationale for doing a neck dissection for a patient with follicular thyroid cancer, unless they've got obvious disease there. Okay, so no role for a prophylactic neck dissection in follicular thyroid cancer. Papillary thyroid cancer is different. Now this is the commonest cancer you get, 80% of all thyroid cancers are papillary. It's got an excellent prognosis. These patients are gonna do really well, but we do know that they can metastasize early to regional lymph nodes. Now, if you have a patient with a papillary thyroid cancer and you go and actively sample the nodes in the neck, up to about 20% of them are going to have micrometastasis present at the time of the original diagnosis. But that doesn't mean that they're clinically significant and doesn't mean that that necessarily needs treated. They do have a predictable pattern of metastasis, and certainly they start off in the thyroid, they go to the ipsilateral, central compartment, they then go to the ipsilateral lateral compartment before going to the contralateral lateral compartment and then distant and down into the mediastinum. And we do know that if the central compartment is completely clear of metastasis, that the risk of there being any lateral compartment disease is very, very low. And so because of this, in certain areas, people suggest that whenever you have a thyroid cancer, that's more than say two centimeters in size, you should do a central compartment clearance. This is very much dependent on what part of the world you live in. Um, it was very popular in the UK for a while. It still is very popular in China. Um, and in fact, in China, I think even patients who get a hemithyroidectomy get a central compartment in some cases. But what this means is basically you've left with a patient who you've got the strap muscles, you've got the carotid sheath, you've got the vagus nerve, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, hopefully a parathyroid left um, behind there, but essentially nothing else. Even the thymus is frequently removed in this. What's the advantage to this approach? Well, those people that say this is a good idea say it reduces local recurrence. And there is good evidence that this is the case. That in experienced surgeon's hands, it adds little to the surgery. And that's always a bit of a double-edged sword because it kind of suggests if you're not doing it, maybe you're not experienced. And as surgeons, we generally like to think that we're, well, we're shit hot at what we do. So hang on, if I'm not doing this, does that mean I'm not experienced? They identify that there's equivalent long-term vocal cord palsy rates, but there is an increase in the short-term cord palsy rates. 
And they can argue that it accurately stages disease and it may obviate the need for radioactive iodine if they don't find any evidence of metastasis in that area. Um, so all of those are potential advantages. What are the disadvantages? Well, this disease is going to do well no, no matter what we do. It doesn't affect the survival. Local recurrence does not mean mortality. It does increase the risk of hypocalcemia. And as I've already said, that can significantly affect a patient's life. And there is certainly at least a short-term increase in vocal cord palsy rate. So there are more complications. You can also argue that it rarely alters the treatment plan because yes, if you don't find any metastasis in the central compartment, you could argue that they don't need radioactive iodine. But radioactive iodine is given on the basis of the primary tumor's characteristics. So there's very few patients that you can say categorically, no, I'm not going to give radioactive iodine because I've done the central compartment clearance. And actually, most of them get it anyway. So these days, can we really justify the morbidity of a central compartment clearance unless there is clinically or radiologically obvious disease? And in the UK, we've basically come on the line that you don't routinely do it unless there is significant clinical concern. But that does change in different parts of the world. Any questions on that? I think, um, would you advise a patient with a two millimeter small malignant thyroid to keep under review? Uh, two millimeter, yes. I mean, I wouldn't even sample it. Um, we wouldn't sample that here in Glasgow. You don't, uh, the, the policy has changed recently. I think 2018, we decided that um, there should not be routine FNACs done on any nodules less than a centimeter in size. So we don't routinely sample them, even if they look five five. Um, we wouldn't sample uh, anything less than a centimetre in size. We'd simply get a follow-up scan. And uh, simply because it's no real advantage. Great. Uh, next question from Victoria. If fetal nodal disease in central compartment, would you do a lateral compartment within brackets papillary? Only if there was clinically or radiologically obvious disease in the lateral compartment. Um, so... You do not need to use the print. I mean, in head and neck cancer, you use the principle of going one step beyond. OK, so if you've got disease in the central compartment, you would take the lateral compartment. Now, that's the sort of approach you would do in medullary thyroid cancer. But papillary thyroid cancer, because it is so treatable, because you've got the radioactive iodine, you need to take the disease out that you can see. You don't need to go and do prophylactic clearance. Good. And uh, if you are going to a central compartment, mm -hmm. what you will do with parathyroid exactly? Preserve them. Um, it's very difficult to do a central compartment properly and preserve the inferior parathyroids. Um, even if they're anatomically intact, their blood supply is generally um, significantly impaired, but you do try and preserve the parathyroids as much as possible. The superior parathyroids are easier to identify and preserve with a blood supply. Um, so always take special care about the superior parathyroids because the inferior, you're unlikely to get it properly. Brilliant. I think that's it so far. Okay. Now, advanced disease, the bad stuff, the stuff we don't like. So I've given you the definition of early disease. So advanced disease is thyroid cancer in which there is invasion of surrounding structures that can't be macroscopically cleared or if there's evidence of distant metastasis. Now, that doesn't mean the game's a bogey. There is still stuff we can do. We've still got the radioactive iodine. We've still got the TSH suppression. These things work best when there's very little or preferably minimal disease present. So radioactive iodine works really well when you can't see that there's any obvious disease, which kind of makes sense, but maybe they're putting the wool over our eyes. So what structures can be involved in the area and what can we do about them? Well. The one that we always worry about is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, now, the recurrent laryngeal nerve can be involved in these sort of cancers. And this is where it's very important to know what the function of it is preoperatively. If preoperatively you've got a functioning vocal cord and during the operation you find this superficial invasion of that nerve, you should preserve that nerve and leave disease behind because the morbidity you're going to create 
by sacrificing that nerve is not justified. The radioactive iodine, the other treatments can get good disease control. If, however, it's not functioning, then feel free to sacrifice it because you can't break what's already broken. This is the case for papillary and follicular thyroid cancer. It's different for other forms. If you've got metastatic cancer to the thyroid, if you've got medullary thyroid cancer, that's a different question. But for papillary thyroid cancer, follicular thyroid cancer, superficial invasion with a functioning nerve, leave a bit of disease behind and keep that nerve functioning rather than sacrifice it. Parathyroids, parathyroids don't get invaded, okay? I'm not actually pointing out the parathyroid here. This is a non-recurrent recurrent laryngeal nerve, which um, always sends shivers down your spine. This is the parathyroid here. And as you can see, we've got its blood supply and preserved it. This is actually an inferior parathyroid because it's below the recurrent laryngeal nerve, but that's only because it's a non-recurrent nerve. Otherwise, this would have been the superior. Now, you do not need to routinely sacrifice these. Often the inferior ones do go as part of a central compartment clearance if you've got significant nodal disease present. You should try and preserve it, but the vascularity is going to be impaired. That may change because we've got newer technologies now. We've got some of these sort of uh, immunofluorescence and ICG monitors that will hopefully help us do things better. But you need to pay attention to it. If they're directly involved, it's reasonable to sacrifice one or even two parathyroids, but you would not routinely clear all of them out unless it's very extensive disease that's involved in the higher, whole area. And hopefully then they've got a fifth one that you knew nothing about. Tracheal invasion is always a cause for concern. This is superficial tracheal invasion. Um, you need to know about this before the operation. Something like this you can treat. Something like this causes a bit more cause for concern. This patient presented with airway obstruction and a thyroid mass, and, and this is direct invasion through the trachea of a papillary thyroid cancer. And she'd been told she had asthma for about two years before she eventually came to see us. Now, obviously, airway obstruction of this type is not really compatible with life, so the immediate treatment is to try and improve the airway. Now, you can't do a tracheostomy in this case, but what you can do is you can debulk it. And here, this is, this is us debulking it using a suction monopolar in the same way as you do for an adenoidectomy. Um, and you can gradually just buzz the disease down, clear it out, debulk it, improve the airway. And then a few weeks later, we went on and did a total thyroidectomy, tracheal resection, and this is the result. This is about three months down the line. Here's the scar from the tracheal resection, just do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. That is not recurrence, despite what it may look like. That's actually just granulation associated with this suture. When I do these, I always use a non-absorbable suture anteriorly, because that's the position that's going to be under the most and pressure. The other sutures are normally used dissolvable PDS. And as you can see, you get actually get a very good result, a much better result than if you do a resection for subglottic stenosis. They always tend to get a degree of um, webbing in these positions, but the ones for cancer do very well. So you can manage tracheal disease as long as it's not too extensive. If it is extensive, as in this case, this patient's got disease directly invading over a wide area, you can still stent the patient. This is uh, one of these expanding stents. You need to use a coated stent in this case um, to just push the disease around, otherwise the disease will grow through into it. And then you address the thyroid, give the radioactive iodine, and you can get decent quality of life. Now, you're not going to cure this patient with surgery, but you are likely to get good long-term palliation. And here you see this is a nerve monitor tube that we're using to do his thyroidectomy. Veins, do we worry about them? Well, I mean, the internal jugular vein, we routinely used to resect those when we were doing our neck dissection. So, so that doesn't concern us. But um, what about this? This is the innominate vein, and this is direct invasion. Now, you may think that this then becomes irresectable. It doesn't, but you do need to have the backup of cardiothoracics. Assuming the IJ on the left-hand side is intact, you can actually just resect this whole section and sew up the anominate um, to get disease control. The problem arises if the internal jugular is involved on this side as well, and then, then you have to get creative. You can't apparently, according to my cardiothoracic colleagues, actually do a vein graft of this. Apparently, in the presence of malignancy and a stenotomy, they just fall apart. 
um, so, so they don't do that. But you can resect it as a low pressure system. What can't we remove? Well, the carotid artery isn't really something you'd want to remove. Now, it's a very late stage before the carotid gets invaded. So you're not going to see this much. But how about the larynx? Are we actually prepared to do a laryngectomy as a primary surgical procedure for a patient with papillary thyroid cancer, given what we've said that actually they're going to do well almost no matter what we do? And we have got all these adjuvant treatments. And we can, of course, still use external beam radiotherapy on top of everything else. Similarly, would we be willing to resect the esophagus? I personally have significant problems with doing either a primary laryngectomy or a laryngopharyngectomy for papillary thyroid cancer. I would always do my best to reduce the volume of the disease down to a minimum and then see how they get on with the adjuvant treatments because this is slow growing disease. And even if we don't get rid of all of it, we can always go back in at a later stage. We need to be very careful to consider, are we altering the disease process or simply increasing the short-term morbidity for our patients when we're treating these very advanced disease processes? And bear in mind that local recurrence is not mortality. We can go back in and treat these. So small volume residual disease, we can control, but don't leave big volumes behind. You don't want to leave four or five centimeter lymph nodes just sitting there because it was a bit tricky to get it out in the first instance. Minimize the amount of disease, give the radioactive iodine the best chance of working, and then if necessary, you can consider external beam radiotherapy. That was the situation up till about three years ago, but we're now seeing things coming through. Now, the TKI inhibitors, a lot's been said about that. You've got syndetamib, lanvetamib, and these are starting to have a real effect on some of these advanced thyroid cancers. We're getting patients who are BRAF positive with significantly advanced anaplastic thyroid cancers now surviving two years. This was unheard of previously. Similarly, papillary thyroid cancers and undifferentiated thyroid cancers do respond to the TKI inhibitors, and certainly our experience here, and I know Ian Nixon's experience, he's going to discuss with you from Edinburgh about parotids later, is that you can downstage these patients with the use of TKI inhibitors. They seem to get you a window of about 18 months where you get disease response. After that, they may break out, and we're still not sure the timing of when we should do operations in these cases, but certainly we have successfully used them now as neoadjuvant treatments to try and improve um, our ability to operate on these patients moving forward. And similarly, they can be used for a current disease and advanced disease at the other side of things. So there's all sorts of things that are coming up. This is quite an exciting time. So in summary, I still say that the key treatment for thyroid cancer is surgery, but I've got to accept you may need to consider active surveillance. MDT's discussions are very useful for early stage disease and for advanced stage disease. For the disease in the middle, actually, it's pretty obvious what you're going to do for a thyroid cancer. You take the disease you see out, you clear any nodes out, and you then go on for other treatments. But at the early stages, it's very useful to get the validation of an MDT that either active surveillance or doing less surgery is a reasonable option. And at the extremes of the disease, you've got to be thinking about how much morbidity are you causing? Is there any real need to do a laryngectomy on a patient who's probably only going to survive two years, no matter what you do? You might as well give them a good quality of life than subject them to an extended period of time in hospital and be realistic about your expectations. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great. I think our friend Maya has asked one question. Would that be a two-stage operation or can be done in one go? thyroid and fractal resection. Sorry, Jay, you broke up there. Um, something about a two-stage operation? Uh, would that be two-stage operation or can be done in one go? Uh, thyroid and tracheal resection, I mean. Oh, no, you do that in a single stage. Okay, that's good. And the next question, uh, Victoria, uh, in case of recurrence, why do we see a disease becoming less radioidin responsive. Okay. Um, 
The point is, is that cancers do change and the cancer cells are different to their host cells. So as you go further away from the host cell line, the more effective any given treatment is, the more chance of other things breaking out. Um, with any infection or bacteria, if you've got a very good way of suppressing that, you are going to get some cell lines that are resistant to that treatment. And it's the same with thyroid cancer, same with infections. It is that if you've got an anti-penicillin sensitivity, one time most bacteria are penicillin sensitive, but because we were so effective with the penicillin, we get resistance building up. It's the same with thyroid cancer. It is that those that get killed off by the radioactive iodine get killed off. And it's those that don't or are less sensitive to it that continue to grow. Brilliant. Next question. Can you comment on superficial invasion of trachea? Okay, superficial invasion of the trachea is as long as it's not through and it's just on the cartilage itself, I normally will just do a local shave and then rely on the uh, radioactive iodine in the first instance. I wouldn't do a tracheal resection for something like that. I if I'm concerned about tracheal invasion, I will always do a tracheoscopy preoperatively. And as long as there's no mucosal invasion, either of the trachea or the esophagus, I'm happy to simply take it off the surface. If at time of surgery, it's a bit more extensive, I may take some cartilage away and you can swing flaps into the area to support that area. But radioactive iodine works in these cases. As long as you're not leaving a volume of disease behind, it is very effective. Uh, we've got in our MDT quite a few cases with sub-centimetric uh, primary cancer, mm -hmm. but significant lateral neck disease and aggressive pathology. So I'm a bit skeptic about leaving such nodules if they are U4, U5. So what's your opinion? Okay. If you've got lateral neck disease, then that suggests a disease activity that's aggressive. And I agree, you need to treat the lateral neck and you need to take the thyroid out to use the uh, radioactive body, but that's a different disease process to an incidentally found small nodule that's sub-centimetre in size. Um, and there's no suggestion, and the evidence from Kobe is, is that these patients generally don't progress on to have aggressive disease. So you've got to treat the patients as an individual and not make group decisions simply on the basis of one thing. I myself know, I mean, I've recently had a patient who had um, a fairly extensive uh, cystic metastasis from a papillary thyroid cancer, and the primary tumor is only a millimeter in size in the thyroid. Um, so yes, this disease does happen like that, but that's the exception, not the rule. Brilliant, Omar. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic um, talk with loads of uh, useful information at higher level. It's a really high standard. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Omar. You're most welcome. And uh, we will have a 30 minutes break. Uh, we'll be back at probably um, 25 past one. Thank you.